education, you know, who doesn't think that that is important? Of course, each and every one of us believes that we want every child to be able to achieve and go on to live a happy and productive life. Where we have our policy discussions, of course, is about what is the best route to take in order to give a child and their families, their parents, those opportunities. One of the champions here in North Carolina for uh, improving public schools and creating more options is former State Representative Marcus Brandon. He now heads an organization called Carolina CAN that stands for, and I'll let you uh, tell us the, the actual acronym here. I did have it written down. Here we go. The North Carolina Campaign for Achievement Now. And really that tells you something because that's so uh, where uh, all of us I think can agree. We want more achievement for each and every child regardless of their circumstances. He is a lifelong resident of Guilford County. He grew up there with uh, a family that was very involved in the civil rights movement. He says that that's where he learned the value of public service and that really has helped him to guide him on his path through his life through today. He attended Southern Guilford High School in North Carolina A&T in Greensboro. And then uh, he decided that he wanted to get into public service in elected office. And in fact, he served two terms as state representative in the North Carolina House of Representatives. It was there that he talked a lot about education and the relationship to poverty and lifting families and children out of poverty. And that's why we wanted him to come talk today about what's ahead for his organization and schools in North Carolina. Please welcome former state representative Marcus Brandon. Thank you for the introduction, Donna. I have looked forward for this for a little while now. I was supposed to come earlier and, and I got mixed up with the funder in New York and I had to go there. As you guys know, you have to make sure the coffers are filled. And so um, it has been, it's an extreme pleasure to be here with, a, I consider a partner of mine for a number of years. But when I was in the legislature, we were working very hard to make sure that we have outcomes for kids and um, many of you know that I am a Democrat and so I had to fight that battle. Um, a, a lot, uh, and, and, and a lot more differently than I ever expected, but it was um, a battle worth fighting um, when you're talking about kids. And I appreciate the, um, I appreciate the uh, introduction, but I will start with just a little bit about me. I am a resident of, of, of Guilford County and um, my parents. Um, I am a descendant of the Civil Rights Movement. Ever since I could walk, I have been knocking on doors and passing out flyers. And it never dawned on me that I would do anything other than just that. Uh, but my parents taught me at a year early age about equal opportunity and equal access. And I do believe that my fight in education goes along with that, those values that I taught was taught when I was younger. But what happened was is that when I ran for office, I was the typical Democrat. I was the one that, I was a fundraiser in, in campaigns. And so the first place I took my candidates when I, they were running for office was the teachers union. Uh, that's the first place you go. I never knew anything different and, um, and that I was a Democrat and that it, that's the way it went. And so it wasn't until I ran for office that I actually looked at um, my neighborhood and my communities that I was representing. Someone told me, Marcus, you know that the represent that you want the, the the district that you want to represent has the poorest zip code in the entire state and so i moved there and that's in high point and it's 27260 and i moved there right in the middle and you could ask my mother who cried and wanted me not to live there and um, because i didn't have i don't ha i'm not fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to have the story that i um, grew up in poverty and made it out so I knew what that was like. I don't have that. My parents worked very hard, both college graduates, and so they shielded us from a lot of that. So when I knew that I was going to represent that, I had to figure out what that looked like. And so um, I moved to the neighborhood, and what I found out was it wasn't just a few people like in the school that I went to that didn't make it out of high school. It was mostly everybody. And, um, and I never understood what, I, I just never fathomed that. And so when I was looking at, and I asked all of my interns, anybody that comes works for my campaign, we were gonna knock on doors and I always ask them to ask the question so they could be just as flabbergasted as I was that it was not just a few, it was the majority that did not have a high school diploma. And then once they learned that they didn't have a high school diploma, I understood 
understood that that meant that, that, that they were going to get a felony. And they were like, hey, Representative Brandon, can you get me a job? I certainly cannot. I cannot get you a job if you don't have a high school diploma and you, don't have, and you have a felony on your record. And that's where I learned, where right down the street from my house, two doors down, there was a liquor house. And, um, and that's when I learned what a liquor house was. I, I always thought it was something totally different than what it was. And then, um, and then I understood wh what, why things were the way they were. They didn't have the opportunity, to, like you and I, to go put in an application and look for jobs the way most people do. That's not what happens there. And so their life is about survival. And so it's about money immediately. It's about how am I going to put food on the table at 530 to make sure that me and my kids eat. And none of the things that we talk about and none of the things that we speculate on and the things that are even a reality in their world. It's, it's like almost the whole sub world that, that they, they live in. That's where you see the crime. That's where you see the poverty. That's where you see all of these things that they do to be able to create economics in their communities because they can't work. And... Um, just because of the way the system is. And we all know that, and those are different topics, but it all roots around this education. So I fought when I came. I said, I'm not going to do the same thing. I knew that the school right down the street had been failing kids for 27 consecutive years. And that means a lot whenever you're looking at it. People say, oh, Marcus, we could just, you know, I hear the fantasy from the other side. And, you know, like if we just invest more, if we just do this more, if we do this more. But we all understand that those are not all necessarily things that get our kids moving. And so that's the really the reason why I wanted to come talk to you, because we have politics, we have poverty, and then we got to deal with our participation. But I'll let you know just a little bit about Carolina Can. I'm very proud executive director. We educate for high quality education, regardless of everybody's zip code, um, which is, goes along with your mission around education. And um, we have um, our three year vision is to make significant strides toward expanding existing choice programs. Because um, I do believe North Carolina is one of the best in the country in the, in, in the way that we uh, have in, in, uh, been innovative and the way we deal with choice. Um, encouraging great community involvement in education reform and improving access to high quality education for low income families and, low, and ensuring North Carolina students are graduate students graduate college and career ready and that's very important because we do have an increased graduation rate across the state but our college and career ready numbers are still dismal and that means a lot that means a whole lot uh, when it turns to are people ready to move on to the next phase in their life and i would like to say that that number with college and career ready goes beyond socioeconomics all of our kids are affected by that number every single one of them all demographics and um, but our the goals that we put out this year, I think that we um, are t we we accomplished them, uh, most of them uh, except one expanding opportunity scholarships. I was very proud to work with my partner uh, Daryl Allison with uh, Parents for Educational Freedom to make sure that we this was my baby bill. This is the bill that almost got me hung and killed, and so uh, <laughs> and so. Um, so the so the voucher bill was it's actually uh, solidified in the state of North Carolina. I consider um, we put a fund around it. We expanded that opportunity to include about twenty five thousand more kids. And what that really means is that we don't really have to come back to the General Assembly every single year and begging for that money, that, that this money is going to be there and we can ex continue to expand um, this opportunity to, to low income kids all across the state for a number for at least 10 years. And I think that pretty much solidifies that. And that's a big victory for me personally and a big victory for the state of North Carolina. And establish an achievement school district. Another thing that almost got me hung. Um, as a Democrat, but this is a very important bill. We were very much a part of this particular bill and worked at the forefront. Our organization uh, produced legislation. Um, we worked re really hard with Representative Bryan um, to make sure that this became a reality. Why achievement school districts are important, and we're getting ready to go to the implementation, is that it wasn't necessarily that I had a lot of data that said that this was going to be the big fix for everything. We're only dealing really with five schools. But what we did do is, is that we made sure that in this state that we now have a mechanism that says that we no longer allow students and, and school districts to fail kids for 20 
25 consecutive years. It's the ultimate accountability. And we talk a lot about accountability in the state of North Carolina. And we, it, and, and especially as a person that promotes charter schools and has, uh, I'm on the board of a charter school founding board member. People always like to throw the accountability argument back to us, but I always tell people that we can get shut down. If, 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 if a charter school does not perform well, and if charter school is not meeting expectations, the state of North Carolina has and will shut us down. The ultimate accountability here is, is that you have public schools that have been failing for 20, 25 years and nothing happened. All, all 700 kids will go to that school next August regardless. So just because you have accountability measures doesn't mean that people are being held accountable. And so this bill actually allows us to do that. And so what, what, and I'm very proud of the bill because if the best thing that comes out of this bill is that I always told people, they say it's a little arrogant, but it's true. If you don't want to become an achievement school district, now you can begin the conversations not to become one. And I think that's the best part of this bill that, uh, that students and, 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 and teachers and, 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 and stakeholders all across the state will now be having a discussion about not how to get there. And that's a plus. Um, for the state of North Carolina and I'm excited about achievement school districts and we'll go into more about how we can make those more successful. Um, the other one is equitable funding for charter schools. We do have in the state of North Carolina uh, a, a, a dichotomy where public school students and traditional public school students are receiving more than, um, than students that are in, in charter schools. I believe that is a civil rights issue and an issue that we must deal with because how can you say this public school student gets $8,400? $400 and this one does not and how do we say that this charter school doesn't uh, meet these uh, meet the same criteria I know that in my charter school I spend about five hundred and sixty thousand dollars a year on transportation so all of these myths that you hear about oh they don't provide transportation and they don't and we everybody gets a lunch and this is the tr this is true for most of our uh, most of most of the charter schools that deal with Title I funding or deal with uh, kids that are 125% uh, of poverty, we've got two hands tied behind our back of not only in, in equitable funding, but I want you guys to think about this in just the way we deal with education, period. Um, a charter school, my charter school, we mostly get all of our kids from Guilford County Schools. Most of them are three, four years behind in proficiency. But the, the, the policy is, is that if I don't have them up to proficiency within a year or two, then I get a D or F and, um, on my report card. And the goal is for us is to be able to take those kids that are struggling. So we have some policy issues to deal with on the charter side that we've got to be able to make it sure that it's equitable and to make sure that I, I that, I, that every kid that comes through my door, I have an opportunity to be able to make them successful without being penalized. And so those are the things that we are fighting for at Carolina Can. We're gonna be fighting for more initiatives, but those are the things that we did with 2016. We accomplished two out of three. The last one, we almost got there, passed the House and the Senate, and it got stalled in the in conference committee. And I'll stop talking about that so we could have a pleasant more time. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but this is what keeps me up at night and what I wanted to kind of have a discussion with you guys, and it is a discussion, is that given the existing funding paradigm, how can we leverage stakeholders at the local level to maximize capacity in meeting North Carolina's families and students' needs? And so what do I mean by that? What I'm saying here is this. The truth is North Carolina is eighth in what we produce financially for the state, uh, for our public schools. You hear the, the term 45th, 49th um, um, thrown out there in per people spending and teachers, um, teacher pay, but that's not the truth in terms of what the state legislature puts out. For example, the, uh, for example, in Connecticut, their state legislature pays their teachers $28,000 a year. We far exceed that in state of North Carolina, what we pay our teachers. What you don't see and because we decided 100 years ago that we wanted little Anson County to look like Guilford County and we wanted that to be equitable. And it was a great thought process. But as you see, as time has gone on and has, as, as, as more innovation has gotten in it and, and we have more families and more diverse needs, that's almost an impossible task for the state to handle it by itself. And I let people know that not only we're we doing this for Manny Oda Murphy for every public school, we have 57 community college that we have to pay for every building and every teacher and every cafeteria worker in there. 
and we have 17 public universities that we pay for every building and every professor and every cafeteria worker in there. And so when you do that also for public schools, you have a huge, huge amount of money that's being spent on public education. I, for one, am very proud of what our state legislature does for North Carolina public schools, regardless whether it was Republican or Democrat, all, both governors and, and, and majority leaders and have faced the same exact issues. And we, you could see it, it doesn't matter when the Republicans were in charge, we had the same fight, and when Democrats were in charge, we had the same fight because we have a reality in North Carolina about how we fund. And so I am not here to advocate for more taxes. I am not here to advocate for giving people more uh, taxing authority. What I am here to say is, is that we have examples of great public-private partnerships that we can engage in to increase the capacity of local participation. Because we have abdicated and we have a culture that has abdicated the responsibility solely to the state, you have now seen that culture devolve from the point in the 70s where in the 80s where we had 85 to 90 percent PTA participation rate. We've seen that dwindle down all the way to five 10% participation. We've seen local stakeholders, cities who don't even have a budget at all to deal with education, not one iota, and they've abdicated that responsibility to the state. And so um, what you have is a huge vacuum. In Connecticut, their state pays 28,000, their LEA pays 10, their county pays 10, their city pays 10, and that's how people can make $70,000 a year. Here, we might have supplements in some of our richer counties that will supplement um, our teachers, but pretty much the majority of our folks are left with what the state gives them for pay, and that's the end of it. And so that's not really the case all across the country. So we have this reality that we really got to deal with and in terms of that. So how do we do it? And that's why we're going to have a discussion because there's a lot of ways that we could do it and I'm not an expert on it but I would love your input in, in terms of like how do we what you think the space is and when I say space I believe everybody has a space and we have examples like Project Lift in Charlotte or Yes Guilford in, in, in Guilford County where you've seen the private sector meet with the local government to be able to create capacity around a certain goal. And yes, Guilford, we could argue whether the goal is meaningful or not. But we, but but it was, it, but 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 it was people that came together and said, "Hey, private sector, we need X amount of million dollars." And the 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 the, the county commissioners and came together and said, "Okay, we're going to match that, and we're going to make sure all kids go attend college, whatever that means." And so, but they did it, and so, and so they created that capacity. And Project Lift, uh, me and um, now Senator Tillis worked really hard to be able to pre create the environment or, or create uh, new laws that we could have a public-private partnership where the business community came together there and they decided that we were going to take care of a certain segment of Charlotte that was just dismal in performance and created something like an I zone, almost like an achievement school district where we brought in. Um, great Teach for America folks, we extended school days, we dealt with parental involvement, infused a lot of money in there, extended uh, a lot of things, and you saw numbers jump 30, 35 spots, um, points in their performance because we engaged in that public-private partnership that's still continuing today. So it is my belief that, um, that since the state of North Carolina has created the environment that we are a top-heavy state in what we deal with in education. It is incumbent upon our state to be able to, re to change that culture and change that mindset. So that's why I really believe that public-private partnerships is a way to go. How do we incentivize that? Can we take existing money that we have that are geared for why kids don't come to school ready to learn, the wraparound services, the, uh, the English as second language, all of these monies that we have in our state coffers. And I can tell you there's about 80 million or more dollars there um, that somehow goes elsewhere. Um, but but, uh, but there, there, there is enough funding there, but I, it is just an idea in terms of like how do we be able to, how we're going to be able to create that capacity. And there is a capacity issue that we have in the state of North Carolina, and I, uh, I will open it up and leave it there to see if anybody has any questions about that proposal, but like that's where I'm at with it. We have great policies, and I was telling on the radio show, 
The policies doesn't do anything. As a former person that made policy and has been doing this my whole life, you can make policy, but policy creates access for people. And so, I, for example, I have one charter school policy. I have great charter schools, and I have not so great charter schools. They're all under the same policy. It's people that make those charter schools work and make those charter schools successful. And that's the same thing with ASD and achievement. It's going to be people. Yes. Um, in the current funding, um, the state funds basically the, the teacher salaries, correct? Right. And then are there some, in the past I think there were, I'm not sure now, are there barriers to what a locality can put into the school system? Are there barriers about the monies that they can put in? Or are they able to put in whatever monies they have? There are barriers if it's not like local, uh, local um, the LEAs, number one, has a barrier. They can't create their own tax system. That's okay. one barrier. The other thing is, is that county commissioners only have the solely responsibility of dealing with facilities. And if they do any type of funding mechanism, it could only be around that. The other barrier is, is that money that comes in is not necessarily controlled by the county commissioners or the LEAs, how that gets spent. We've been working on that in the General Assembly um, to deal with that particular issue, to give them a little bit more flexibility about how they can maneuver money to keep teachers or to do programs that they want. But they don't necessarily have full autonomy over the money. child left behind. We get raised to the top, never tested in any state, but nationally mandated. Now the poor teacher has to deal with this stuff. Diverting your attention from the quality of content and over a period of eight or ten years, you see the kids with a poorer quality of life falling further behind. Them. And, I, and I'm saying, I understand money is an issue, but yeah, I don't think that money is the biggest issue. You won't be, I'm one Democrat that you won't find that says that because the truth is this, most of the schools that we're talking about receive the most money. <laughs> they receive far more money than the regular, the schools that I'm talking about, these achievement school districts, these impoverished, they receive a ton of money. They get Title I funding, they get all other types of grants, their per people, per, uh, their per people spending high exceeds. Um, what I'm saying is, is that the capacity is not there because we're not really dealing with the, the issue of why they're not coming to school ready to learn. You could throw more money at a broke system and all it does is just makes it more broke. And that's what you've seen in education year after year. Yes, sir. Marcus, I don't know if this speaks specifically to the question of state versus local, but I'm curious your thoughts about how to pay teachers and the, the role that performance should pay. If you were in the legislature talking these things through, now you're looking at it from a different vantage point. Should we be putting more money into performance pay directed towards individual teachers who have higher level student, have student test score growth over time? Should we be putting more focus on schools, having bonuses like we used to have under the ABC system for entire schools or maybe for grades within schools based upon the student growth or some other performance measure? Should we be providing these bonuses like has been is now going to be experimented with, will we pay teachers according to how many of their students pass certain types of certifications, like the IT certification for uh, career and technical education? What should the role of performance be measurable or maybe supervisory from principals? What, what role should performance pay to play in North Carolina? I'm glad you asked that question. It's a, me and my team are working hugely <laughs> on um, on this for 2017. We want to work with Best NC, who's been doing a lot of this work. Um, um, and I do believe that performance pay, teacher pay, um, it, professionalizing the, 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 um, the teachers is a, is a huge part of, of making sure this happened. This is what happened in Project Lift, basically. Um, as you see, a lot, there was a lot of performance pay in there. There was a lot of pay for teachers. One of the big reasons why we need to do this is because our best teachers leave the classroom for pay. They become facilitators, they become uh, principals, and they become all of these things simply because they're trying to get a higher a salary. But, and and, and what, if we pro actually professionalized the, um, the industry and pay teachers for being that mentor, 
um, for being that facilitator, for having strong performance, uh, for, uh, uh, for doing the things. That, uh, there's a definitely a difference between the teacher that leaves at 3.30 right when the bell rings and the teacher that is there at 6 o'clock. But right now we have a method where they all get paid the same exact money, um, whether you do that or if you don't do that. So what incentive is it is for you to be able to, just like you in your professional jobs, to be able to do things professionally that you're going to be able to be rewarded for. There is no reason for that. So that's why teachers do everything they can to get out of the teaching and to be able to do something. And it's not necessarily their talent. Their talent is being in education and teachers. That is a talent. You could, it, 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 and we should keep those teachers, but right now we don't have a mechanism to be able to do that. And uh, uh, right now it's just like, you're just like every other teacher and you move up just like every other teacher. I think it's very important in terms of the way we deal with ed reform, the way we talk about it, um, that we bring in high effective teachers. And the only way that we're gonna be able to know that is we keep evaluating teachers. And then and the only way we can keep them and retain them is if we professionalize it and we'll be able to pay them more money. And I bet you anything, your teacher average will go up um, based off of this because I do believe that public-private partnerships is a lot more easier to obtain when people who are engaging in them understand the mechanism. And so why should I give you more money for teacher pay when we don't have any mechanisms to evaluate it and we don't have any really data that says that, that because you give teachers more money that I have better outcomes, right? So. Um, and we don't have data that says that. And so, but we do have data that when you empower teachers and when you professionalize it, we have, we have solid data on what you're talking about and, and, um, uh, and professionalizing teachers and incentivizing them to do their work, their skill, their craft. And just as like you and your skill and your craft, uh, whenever you're rewarded and you're uh, given the opportunity to expand that, you take it and you, and, and, and you do well at it. And I believe our teachers would do the same way. Yes, sir. Uh, do you find that the uh, charter schools uh, have a various uh, curriculum? Is, is there a standard type of curriculum, or does it vary a lot among the schools? No, we have pretty much, I would say our curriculum is a little different, but we have the same standards that we have to meet as public schools, the traditional public schools. And so. When you say ours, in North Carolina? Or in North Carolina, yes. We, we have, we're, we're graded, we have to take the same test. Uh, there might be a different way to get there, uh, but uh, in terms of curriculum, but, but um, uh, because of the students that we have. And I know a great charter school down the street is doing personalized learning now. They have a totally different curriculum, doing really well with that. So uh, it really depends on um, the school. But at the end of the day, we all take the same test. Brandon, I have a question for you about education and poverty. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a household Well, you have 40, 50, 60 years of talking points that's been in bed. Like I said, I was the normal Democrat. I wouldn't even looked at this issue. I would have been on the other side of this issue fighting this to tooth and nail until I actually seen it for my eyes only. And I will say that this is a, um, this, this problem runs so deep. Uh, and I can't really express how deep it runs in terms of the establishment. I call it the nonprofit industrial complex that we have on the left. <laughs> and, that, um, and so there are, there, there are groups that would love to talk about things the way I talk about it. But because of their funding and because of the way they get funding, um, you cannot do it. Like, for example, I ran for Congress. Um, and, and because I supported this issue, the teachers union 
did not support me. But that means also AFL-CIO can't support you. And that also means the firefighters can't support you. And that almost so means that so it's almost impossible to support an issue like this. And I try to, to let my white progressive know who, I, who are my friends and heroes that you're probably one of the top five reasons why my kids are the way they are. Just because you marched with Martin Luther King does not mean that it stopped there. And that if you had a policy, and, 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 and the person that took my seat, Representative Brockman, could not have said it better when he was talking about achievement school districts. But if we had a policy that led to 70% of, of white kids not performing, and two-thirds of white kids being kicked out of school, and two-thirds, uh, and, and white kids were three times more likely to drop out, it would be an incomplete crisis. Everybody would go completely nuts. And, but that is the reality for African-American kids in the public schools. Two-thirds of us are not performing at grade level. We're twice as likely to get kicked out, three times more likely to drop out. And so and most of that deals with poverty. And what I get mad about my friends on, the, on my side um, is, is that, when you're yelling about money and you're yelling about funding and this, that, and the other, if you're not yelling about it in terms of making sure that that funding is dealing with poverty, then you're just not even talking about anything, right? Because we, ha and, and to me, that's their biggest voice and that they could have instead of, oh, charter schools. I'm like, you're, the schools were doing very poorly before there ever was a charter school and there was ever a voucher program. Don't come to me talking about this is the problem. That's not the problem. It wasn't the problem 20 years ago, and it's certainly not the problem now. Um, and so whenever they're ready to have an honest discussion about it, about what poverty and how impactful poverty is to this, and be able to really go back to the roots of why you know we all got into this work to begin with, and that is to address systematic problems um, that, 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 hold, that, that hold families up. And poverty is definitely one of those issues. It doesn't matter where we go. You don't have to go find low performing schools. We know exactly where to go to find them. And we all can get there in a matter of 10 minutes. So. Uh, when you interact with parents, what feedback do you get? I'm sorry? When you talk with the parents of these children. The parents are fine. This is an elite conversation. Uh, like it's, it's ama it was amazing when I was sitting in caucus supporting charter school, lifting the cap of the charter school, and they were telling me, you got to support your constituency. And I had a PPP poll that said that like 70% of black people support what I'm saying. You support your constituency. It's like, so this is a very, this is a very elite, the NAACP, the teachers union, are talking amongst themselves. They're not talking to the... I, I, Whenever I ran for office, I ran for re-election, we won every single precinct. They came after me with all that mess, but we didn't lose a precinct. And that's because the, the parents know, they're the ones that go to those schools, they know what's happening, they see the outcomes, and just because they're poor does not mean that they're stupid. Uh, my parents are very smart, and they understand that the only way that their kids are not going to be like them is that they, they have a decent education. They also understand that, you know, the school that they have is not performing at the levels that they want it to. And so, and they also understand they have no option in that. And so they are not privy to this knowledge. And so they get it, and that's why you see the poll after poll after poll. I don't care if Civitas does it, I don't care if PPP does it, the poll is the same. African Americans want choice. And choice is as American as apple pie, so it's a very common sense that they would want it. Yes. Um, with, um, with the funding, I always say, you know, if, if funding was the only issue, if the teachers were just about salaries, then none of them would work at charter schools, right? right? Because generally the charter schools pay a little bit less than right. some of the other ones. Um, so what is it about the charter schools that attract teachers? I think it's the, what I'm talking about here, I think it is the fact that charter schools do a much better job of doing, building that capacity, that community, that deals with why kids don't come to school ready to learn. I know at my school, my, ch my, kids, my, my teachers do get paid a little bit less, and they do come in on Saturday, but they do that because they know that they're going to have, just because I have a charter school doesn't mean that I don't have parents that don't bring their kids to school at 930, that I don't have all the issues of poverty like, like the other low-performing schools, but you have to get in there, and you have to take, roll up your sleeves, and you have to work at it. You can't just be like, oh, 
you know, it's a charter school, so all, it's a magic bullet. No, we had to work. We had to knock on doors. We had to go out there. But those, those, those teachers feel a sense of involvement, sense of uh, inclusion of that commitment to what we have in the community. They don't mind making a little bit less if they can see the results come out of it. And so they see the results. And I can tell you that our school, that is not a kid that has been with us for more than two years that is not reading on grade level, that is not proficient, not one. say the schools with good outcomes versus those with bad outcomes. It almost sounds like the main difference is just the ones with bad outcomes are being run by people that are lazy or just have a sense of entitlement to their positions and don't really concern themselves with how well they perform whereas the others are more motivated. But I'm, I'm just wondering, is there some other explanation that could it's bureaucracy. I mean, like, we all know it. Like, I mean, it's, a, it's the, one of the things that really disappointed me as a Democrat that I found out in being a legislator that it's true. <laughs> Government's terrible at running stuff. And so, like, it's like, it's so, like, it's like, it's so, like, it's so, like, it's so, like, that really becomes the, like, that, that, that really becomes the issue that like I do believe I'm not I do believe that government has a responsibility to fund and make provisions and regulations but as long as we're in the business of implementing that's always it's never been really good even when Republicans tried to implement health care in the state of North Carolina it, catastrophe it was awful and so like so it doesn't matter really like which way you go with it like it's just bad and so what you have is bureaucracy that looks at Social Security numbers are not people, and you look at, at, at this is a system, and this is the way we have to work, regardless if that child fits in that system or not. And what you find is, is when you have set, this is one thing someone told me a long time ago, and you can look at this for what it is. If you are going to the pond, and you see one fish dead, you're like, turn, what's wrong with that fish? But if you come back to the pond the next day, and 70% of the fish are dead, you're going to say, what's wrong with the water? And it's time for us to start asking, what is wrong with the water? It is not because we have bad teachers. It is not because we have bad principals. We have a horrible system and that they operate in. And that is my fight. And that's why we have to continue to be able to revamp our education system to make it more free market, to make it more choice. And then on the top of that, we've got to build those policies and bridge them to make sure that people understand that they have a space in the local participation, whether you are a, whether you are a, a corporation that can give computers or financial donations, whether you're an individual, that a professional that can go to a school and lead your, uh, give your professional expertise, or whether you're just a regular community member that wants to be a lunch buddy, or that wants to be a, a, a mentor, or could give a dollar to make sure that somebody has a book in their library, or stop at Walmart and make sure that somebody has a white shirt that's clean when they come to school. There's all types of reasons why kids don't come to school ready to learn. And every single one of you, and me, and everybody that you know has a space in that. And that's the culture that we have to change. It's a massive capacity. It's huge. And, and so when you're talking about meeting all these different needs for all the different kids for Manny Oda Murphy, that is incredible. And so it's going to take everybody. And so one of the things that we're going to have to do in the state of North Carolina is get rid of this mindset that the state is the only one that's responsible for this and, to, and, and make sure that everybody understands that not only is the state, but you are responsible. Local, as an individual, as a business owner, as a professional, you're responsible. You're responsible. Where have you found success in engaging parents, whether it's um, at your charter school or your board member of, or, or just in general in, in talking to other uh, people involved in, in helping kids? In other words, what, what is it that maybe some of us are missing about those kids who aren't coming to school or coming ready to learn? Is it poverty? Is it lack of clothing? Is it that's yeah, just cultural. Like we start school at 730. That's very difficult for a lot of folks. Um, and, and, and it's just a lot of different things that like when you're dealing with cultural issues, black people are different. They, we are. There's nothing wrong with that. There's not like people like, oh, they're different. There's nothing wrong with people being different. People are different. There's not some people like some people come to school and ready to learn at 730. Black people don't. 
and just like like it's like it's 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 it's, it, and it's just one of those things, especially when you have parents who are single parents, and and they have different issues of why they can't get there at 9:30 or or, or, or 8:30, um, and some people think I'm making excuses, but I'm really saying that there are cultural issues that I ran into that like when I'm living in the community of why people don't make it there, and because um, I it was mind-boggling to me. I had two great parents. We made it to school a long time, but everybody doesn't have two great parents uh, that, that, that is engaged like that. And I'm not saying that you're a bad parent because you can't get there, but I'm saying that you might not have those skills. You might not be valued that way. There's different values. They, they told me I was learning disabled in seventh grade, put me in LD class. Dolores Brandon said, I don't care. You're still expected to make an A. And so, like, and so, and, 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 and that was my life. It didn't matter that I had ADHD. My mama told them they were the one that was crazy, but I, <laughs> but I was expected to perform, and I was expected to perform regardless of that. So I had that root. I understand that I'm here because of that root, that if I would not have had Dolores Brandon and Kenneth Brandon doing that, I would have been a statistic very easily. I would have been in the learning disabled. They would have stuck me off in the class and I, because they didn't know how to deal with me, and I would have just been another person on the street and that's why I fight why I fight because there's a lot of Marcus Brandons there I see them every day who are way smarter than me and they have way much more talent and they are and their opportunity is extremely limited because of schools that they're stuck in that doesn't allow them to thrive yes you uh, wanted to avoid the discussion but what do you think are the chances that the charter schools will ever get full funding for I think that we have a good chance. I think that we need to probably look at it in the ways that, that we deal with um, some of our uh, smaller charter schools that have two hands behind their back and really bring that out forward. One of the bigger problems we have in the state of North Carolina is that some of our, uh, our, uh, our legislative members on particularly, we already know where most Democrats stand. So. I could tell you charter funding didn't stop because of Democrats. So we've got a lot of work to do with our, 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 our GOP friends that don't necessarily have charters in their district, getting them to understand the importance of it um, and, and, and why that is because um, they, it's a funding issue. You got a lot of them that came from county commissioners that dealt with funding as a county commissioner that are very leery to go back to their hometown and say, hey, we've taken more money from public schools. When in all actuality, if people were honest about this situation and knew the history of it, Democrats took these money, took this money out under the Hackney Amendment. This is money that charters are owed. This is not money that we're trying to, that they were taking away. We originally had this funding. And, 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 and so we took that money out uh, trying to, in whatever way, to, um, to limit charter schools' uh, ability to grow. But what they did is to tied a lot of people's hands behind their back. This is not money, taking money from public schools. This, and we've got to be, able to, com to, to, to be able to communicate that more effectively, I think, this time, is that they took the money from us and we're just wanting to get it back. And that's really exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Charter schools is less than, than traditional. The only thing I can see charter schools doing is try to get pay equity for their teachers. They t yeah, no, that's not well. I will tell you that we this, we have to pay for our own schools. Whenever whenever my heat and air condition go out, I don't get to call county. I got to call somebody and write a four thousand dollar check right then. And um, and, and, and are we own our own building. We had to pay for that. The county didn't pay for that. There's a big, huge difference in what charters have to pay and what public schools, uh, traditional schools have to pay. We pay our own facilities. I, like I said, I spend five hundred sixty thousand dollars a month transporting kids. You know, and and and, and I, I mean, not a month, a year. I spend about four, about fifty thousand dollars a year, a month transporting kids. That's a lot of money. I know people think that oh, it's not a lot. It's a lot of money. And so, like, and so. Um, and then you have to provide food for everybody. That's a lot of money. None of that we get from the state. And so uh, those are, the, as, as, so you take a building that we've had to, to not, we had to stop leasing at $15,000 a month and then and, and to make sure that we buy. These are, these are things that normal charter schools go through. They, for three years they have to lease. Then they have to buy the building. And then 
all of that costs millions of dollars, none of which the state pays for. So it's a bargain for the state because they don't have to pay for this stuff. And then, and, but we're paying for it. So all we're asking is for, can you just give us the same money that you give the other people? You know what I'm saying? Like that, uh, it, I do believe that we will be able to come to agreement on this uh, to answer your question because it, for one reason, every single charter school that has taken this court has won. And because it is illegal on its face, and, 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 they're, they're, and, and so there's no way that they can win it. So either we need to threaten a class action lawsuit against everybody, all of our counties, or they need to come up, step up to the plate and make sure that everybody, and I'm going to be very forceful about this because it is very, it, it's just, it's just the, the most total blatant, uh, uh, I'm going to give you an amount and I'm going to give you an amount and they're both public school students. Like you, it, it, there's no law, there's no logic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Marcus, when you were in the legislature and now again looking at it from, from uh, outside in, how do lawmakers get the, the information that they use to make the decisions you've been talking about? What's the most important or some of the most important sources? Do they get it, do they get it primarily from interest groups that are, have a direct interest in our education policy matter? Does the Raleigh media play a larger role than the media back home in informing lawmakers and getting them a sense of what they might want to do? I do believe there's a little bit of both of that. I think that the interest groups definitely get the ear um, of folks. And that's not never necessarily the final the final decision of why you make decisions. Um, and then definitely your media back home plays, because you know, that's how you get elected and it, that's the voice that, that like your local newspaper is going to um, promote that. But I also think that a bigger part of it is personal experience. And I think that um, you see that in a number of bills. You see people that carry bills close to their heart. That sometimes you're like, hey, that's a Democrat. Why is he supporting that? Or that's a Republican. Why is he supporting that? But then you find out they have a family member or they have something that's very close to them. So personal experience. And to me, this whole issue is a personal experience. I would have never have done it unless I would have actually went and knocked on doors and in a very impoverished neighborhood and actually seen what lack of education looks like after four years right and so that's why I did it so I do believe personal experience does a lot to deal with that I do believe that interest groups can build a, a, a pretty good for me I tell everybody's like oh you became a lobbyist <laughs> but like it's like it's like uh. but like I tell people that it's almost like family and it's almost like you have to have them there's 1200 bills that come across our desk you need lobbyists to be able to um, to be able to understand how many fish it takes to swim without hazard in the French Broad River in Asheville. I don't know that, but like, but like, a, like but a lobbyist would know that. And you know, how many chickens can a chunk carry in Smithfield without them falling off and becoming a hazard? Like, I don't know that, but a lobbyist does. And so like, it's like so, um, so you do rely a lot on special interest groups to be able to, to give you information. And you want both sides to come give you both sides so you can make an informed decision. Um, and in all those cases, you'll have an environmental group to come and tell you only 50 chickens. And then you'll have another group that says, well, I need at least 80 chickens to make this happen. And you know, like you, you know, as a freshman, you're thinking, this is a law? And so, but it has like, <laughs> but it has to because evidently somebody drove down in Smith Mill with too many chickens. So now we got to make a law. But, uh, but, but there's things like that. Absolutely. Um, I do believe that interest groups for me was hugely important to come and be able to educate me on the issues. And I think that is um, pretty much true for everybody. Mm -hmm. Marcus Brandon from Carolina. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>